Um, an introduction of our guest speaker, Robert M. Weir, works and plays with words. After working in radio, television, and the school yearbook business, the discovery of a brain tumor caused him to reassess his life. It reminded him of his mortality, motivated him to create his creative writing skills and reorient his career. Since the 1990s, Have Laptop Will Travel has been the theme of his life. He has enjoyed success as the author of many magazine articles, travel blogs, and books, including Peace, Justice, Care of the Earth, the biography of John McConnell, founder of the original Earth Day, and Brain Tumor, a medical memoir about his experiences with a benign meningioma. The November 2023 issue of Encore Magazine featured Bob's article on modern day nomads, those who dwell in their vehicles. Bob is also a writer's coach, an editor, and a public speaker who gives presentations about people, peacemaking, social justice issues, environmentalism, and his many travel adventures. Thank you, Bob, for being here. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, great introduction. Thank you much. And Miriam, thanks for all of the communication that you had with me over the past week to uh, and before that to bring this together. And thank you to all of you who are here joining us on the Zoom session on a cold uh, Sunday morning. Uh, you know, people sometimes complain about the weather, but this is what God is giving us today as part of the universal energy. So uh, it, fortunately, we have the Zoom connection. Uh, and thank you just for the presence of, of inviting me back. It's been almost a year. Uh, it was February of last year when I spoke with you folks before, and I always enjoy uh, participating in the service. Before I begin the um, meditation and reading, uh, I'm going to switch over to sharing my screen and um, just go ahead and do that. Give me a moment. Okay, you'll see that there's a loaf of bread there, and this is meditation. When um, when Miriam asked me if I would do a meditation I or a reading, I happen to be reading something that caught my attention about bread. So I invite you to be comfortable, um, take some good breaths, look at the screen if you want to, or close your eyes, whatever makes you comfortable and brings you into a state of uh, a greater peace. So I invite you, invite you to think of bread, a loaf of bread, all the ingredients in the bread, flour, water, yeast, maybe salt and seasonings such as cinnamon, maybe raisins or nuts, maybe a coating on top. The certain ingredients are necessary. The flour, the water, the yeast, and other ingredients add something special for an extra tasty meal. Bread comes in many forms and with many names, white, whole wheat, multigrain, sourdough, French, Italian rye, pumpernickel. Sometimes we name bread by its shape or texture, croissant, ciabatta, baguette. But regardless of the shape and size, think of how we bake bread, especially by hand in a home oven. We mix the flour and water into dough. We add the yeast, we add the other ingredients. We knead the dough with our hands and it feels good as we blend it all together so that each ingredient is melded in with the other ingredients. Think about how we bake bread, whether at home or in a bakery and smell the aromas, those striking aromas that arouse our taste buds and our desire to hold the warm loaf or slice in our hand and eat it. Think about how we eat bread as a standalone treat, as a holder of other items, such as with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, as the foundation for pizza, as a part of a larger meal, maybe in a special form, such as a dinner roll or as a crust for pie. Bread is a staple of life. People carry it on picnics and into the wilderness. Bread is the staple of spirituality, especially in Christian religions that believe in the transformation of bread into the Eucharist of divine salvation. 
The Lord's Prayer contains the phrase, give us this day our daily bread, which is a reminder that we are blessed, that our physical needs are met, that we have food, the bread for our needs. Bread is a symbol of friendship, fellowship, and camaraderie, as stated in the phrase, let us break bread together. In that regard, bread is a manifestation of love and caring. The author, Ursula Le Guin, wrote this about love and bread. She said, love doesn't just sit there like a stone. It has to be made like bread and remade all the time, made new. Sometimes with love, we have to add more water to make our love more fluid. Sometimes we have to add more flour to remind ourselves and each other to stick together. Sometimes we have to add more yeast as a symbol to grow together. And sometimes we have to add more salt or spice to give our love and our life a bit more zest. Sometimes we have to knead the dough, blend it all together and make our love more cohesive. Like bread, love reminds us that we are one ingredient in the larger loaf but that we are a necessary ingredient, a very necessary ingredient, just as are all the other ingredients, all the other people in our life, whether that life is part of our congregational loaf, our tribal loaf, our community loaf, our societal loaf, and our global loaf that includes all humanity. We change and others change. To repeat the words of Lagin, love has to be made like bread and remade all the time, made new. This takes work, it takes effort, but the reward is divine. With that, I invite you to open your eyes, if you choose, if you haven't already, and the words of Lagin are on the screen for us to take in with our eyes. And so it is. Again, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. Over the last 40 years, I've had the privilege and pleasure to associate with some wise and wonderful people from whom I've learned much about the topic I want to share with you today. Peace through understanding. These people showed me not only the concept of peace through understanding, but also how to implement understanding and thus attain peace. I do not claim ownership for what I'm going to say today. I am simply a sponge who absorbed that wisdom from others, from the wise ones. I am the messenger who is bringing their wisdom to you today. One of the wisest people in my life was my dad, Martin Weir. He liked to hear motivational speakers because as he said, none of us are smart enough to remember what we already know. I would add to that, in the heat of strife and emotion, it is often difficult to remember the necessary wisdom that will enable us to rise above that strife and thus reattain the energy of peace. Even if we know how to be peaceful in those times of strife, it's a challenge to remember. And when we love another and we see something that bothers us about the other, we can easily become agitated, not at peace within our loving heart. And what do we do then? Well, today I'm going to offer some suggestions that work, suggestions that came from the wise ones who brought that wisdom to me. Now, if you want, and I want to plant a couple of seeds here, today's presentation is actually the first of what could be a four-part series about how to attain loving peace and maintain loving peace in our lives. Peace through truth, peace through forgiveness, peace through accepting and allowing. If you'd like me to present these, this entire series in the future, I would welcome that opportunity because I really enjoy working with you folks. I also want to bring two other topics into our conversation. 
These are topics that I've encountered and brought into my consciousness since the last time I was here. And so I'm sort of bringing you up to speed or, or in sharing some news of what I've experienced over the last year or so. The first is a book that I've written, Conversations Through the Veil. It's about connecting with the spirits of deceased loved ones. In this case, through a medium, I connected with the spirits of my mother, my father, a former spouse, and others. I learned messages that were important to me to understand my relationship with them, but I also learned about universal laws and principles that apply to anyone and everyone. And I've written a book about that experience. I've given this presentation to other UU fellowships and spiritual groups, and the comments indicate that the message is worthwhile. So there's one topic I'd like to offer to you. The second topic has to do with Indian boarding schools. Perhaps you've heard of them. They existed in the United States from 1879 to 1983. Five were located in Michigan. Their purpose was to deprive the indigenous people of their culture and heritage. On June 6, the Native American tribes in Michigan hold an event at the site of a former Michigan Indian Industrial Boarding School in Mount Pleasant. The ceremony is called Honoring, Healing, and Remembering. I attended last summer, and I intend to go again on June 6, 2024. I'm also going to facilitate a two-hour class on the subject through Western Michigan University's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. This will be in late May. The details are yet to be determined, which you can find information on the OLLI website. My role will be that of a moderator. I'm going to create an environment for elders to tell their stories of abuse while they were students in the school, as well as their current actions for resilience, forgiveness, and hope. There's really is a powerful message. And again, you can find information on the OSHA website or uh, the website for the Saginaw Chippewa tribe of Native American Indians. And as a bit of other news, Encore Magazine, who Pat mentioned, I've been writing for them since 1996, and this year they're celebrating their 50th anniversary of publication. In that event, I have uh, published two books, one about my about the articles that I've written about outstanding people. And I'm going to be teaching a class about this through about Encore through the OSHA program next month at February 15 and 22. And you can find those details on the OSHA website. But back to the topic for today. Have you ever felt uncomfortable with someone, especially someone you are emotionally close to or care about? someone you love? Have you ever felt yourself asking, why would he or she do that? Don't they know better? Have you ever told someone, I don't understand what makes some people think that way or do what they do? Have you ever told someone, I don't understand you? Have you ever explained either aloud or silently, that person or people like that really make me mad? Then perhaps as you calm down and mellow a bit, you might have the thought, I'm not at peace at this moment. I don't feel good with myself. I wish I could understand or I want to understand. Please help me to understand. You've probably done this. I know I have and probably everyone has. After all, we're human beings. We have emotions. We care. We care enough to get angry. We care enough to love. And we love enough to want to fix what we think is broken or what isn't right in our world, in our relationships. In that regard, we are normal. <clears throat> so how do we go about fixing what's broken and what doesn't feel right, especially within ourselves? One te technique is to ask questions related to the question to the word why, and keep asking why until we get to the root cause of the problem. This technique applies to things as well as to personal relationships. So I'm gonna start with an example of a broken machine that might be a little bit easier to visualize than with a human 
relationship situation. So imagine that you were standing a few feet away from an assembly line and you observe that the conveyor belt isn't moving. This is a problem. You ask, why? Why has the conveyor belt stopped moving? You step closer to the problem and you observe because the roller that drives the conveyor belt isn't turning. Okay, why has the roller stopped turning? Because the pulley on the end of the roller's drive shaft isn't going around. Why is the pulley not going around? Because the drive belt that makes it go isn't moving. So why isn't the drive belt moving? Because the drive pulley on the electric motor isn't spinning. And one more why question, why isn't the drive pulley spinning? And you discover because the shear pin on the electric motor's drive spline has sheared, it's done its job. So we replace the shear pin, which is not visible underneath the motionless drive pulley. And then everything, including the drive belt, the conveyor belt begins to move again. The problem is solved. Now, this is a simplistic illustration. I understand that, but it helps us to understand how asking the question why can lead us to the root cause of the problem. They can all, the same technique can be used to apply to our human relationships. But the solutions are even harder to see than a hidden shear pin. They tend to be emotional and we can't see emotionals, emotions. We only see the symptoms, the actions, the reactions that come from our emotions. And here's an example. A wife come home, comes home late on a Friday afternoon. She's tired from a hard week at her office job. She wants peace and tranquility. And she sees that the lawn has not been mowed, even though her husband, who had the afternoon off from his job, had promised to mow it. That's a problem for her, especially right now. And she's angry. Now, if she's willing to move beyond her anger and slide back into a state of calmness, she will incorporate this question of asking why. Why am I upset? Well, obviously, because the lawn hasn't been mowed. So why is it important to have the lawn mowed? Because my, my husband promised that he would mow it today. Why is it important that he broke his promise? Because tomorrow morning, the neighborhood is having a large gathering in which our neighbors will visit each other. And I want our lawn to look nice, to have an inviting lawn. Why is that important? She says to herself, because my husband and I just bought this house a month ago. And this is a great opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are responsible neighbors. So with that thought, she sits down on the porch where she can see the unmowed lawn. And across the street, there's a neighbor, a man mowing his lawn. And she serenely asks herself in this moment of calmer peace, why is being a respectable part of the neighborhood important to me? And with that question, especially the words important to me, she becomes aware of the truism that life is really 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I respond or react. She begins to own her own role in her current reaction. And then an image from her youth flashes through her mind. And this is like the hidden shear pin on the drive pulley. This image shows her, her mother, standing in a rundown kitchen, crying. She sees her father slamming the front door as he, in a state of anger, storms out of their small house that was always in a state of disrepair. And with a sudden inner knowing, the wife says to herself, having a presentable yard and a nice home is important to me because my father was irresponsible. He couldn't keep a job. He didn't take care of us kids and he left mom when I was 13. She sobs and mutters, I want more than that in my life and for my children. She starts to cry as she realizes that the root cause of her emotions is not the lawn sitting there in front of her that's not been mowed. Rather, that is a trigger that because she traced the path of her anger 
took her back to her youth and her feelings about her father. And maybe a fear that she has also married a man who was irresponsible. I mean, the lawn wasn't mowed, even though we promised to do so. She shudders with discontent and uncertainty. And there's the absence of peace. She thinks, we've only been married six months. Do I really know who my husband is? What he's really like? So that's a scenario. But I ask you, does it sound familiar in some way? Maybe the scenarios of your times of discontent are different. Maybe the root cause of your uncertainties are different. Maybe you've been married or in a relationship for years, and you still wonder, who is this person I'm in love with? This person who expresses love to me. Regardless of the diverse scenarios, the concept is the same. What makes us upset is often usually not the problem. What upsets us is the symptoms we see. The root cause is the feeling, the unseen emotion that the symptom triggers deep within our psyche, within our inner being. So the story continues. Having put herself in a better frame of mind, but still concerned about the yard and the neighborhood party, the wife is still sitting on the porch steps, wiping her tears, when her husband comes home a few minutes later. She says to him, again, employing the question, why? Why didn't you mow the lawn like you said you would? And he replies, because I got a phone call from my college roommate. She says, why was that more important than mowing the lawn and keeping your promise to me? He says, because my friend said he was in town unexpectedly and really needed to talk with me. Why did he really need to talk with you? Because a month ago, the husband says, he came home from a business trip and found his wife dead in bed. She had had an aneurysm and died suddenly in their sleep the previous night. All the way home, he had envisioned taking her into his arms and making love with her, and instead he found her dead. The husband continues. My friend apologized for not telling me at the time, but he just didn't want to talk with anyone. That's what he said. He had support from his immediate family, but eventually that wasn't enough. He and I had been close when in college, and today, on the spur of the moment, he bought a standby airline ticket and flew into town unannounced so he could tell me in person. Oh, says the wife. The husband continues. I know I said I would mow the lawn, and I would have, but... The wife puts her arms around him, and with peace in her heart, she says, I understand. Key words, I understand. Through understanding, because she asked why, she has attained that state of peace. Then, in that state of peace, the wife and the husband work together to move on from that moment. She goes into the house to shower and get into comfortable clothes. He goes to the local Chinese eatery and buys their supper. When he gets home with the food, he tells her he's not hungry because he ate with his college roommate, and she's starved. So she eats while he mows the yard, which he finishes just prior to nine o'clock, which is the time their elderly next door neighbor goes to bed. Then they express their gratitude and appreciation for each other. She realizes that her husband is responsible and caring. She decides to reveal to him her thought process that had gone through her mind when she got home that afternoon including her doubts about his integrity. He learns about her, and he understands her better. They are closer emotionally to each other. In the morning, they awake refreshed and energized, and they work together to do all that's necessary to be ready for the neighborhood party. But now let me ask you, do you see the choices this couple made? Do you see that without searching for why, they could have gone in an entirely different direction. She could have chosen to remain angry at him and greeted him with a berating tone. She could have yelled at him and told him that he was irresponsible, just like my father. 
He, feeling sadness because of the news from his college roommate, could have lost control of his emotions and yelled back at her. With venomous words, they could have thrown fuel on the fire and escalated their anger to a higher and higher scale, possibly even violence. It happens. At least they might have slept in separate rooms. In the morning, they would have probably been sour to their neighbors or put on a happy facade while seething inside. That happens too, a lot, maybe with you, sometimes with me. But they chose peace through understanding, especially the wife. She's really the star of this scenario. She sat down to think and reach a deeper understanding of herself, of her inner truth. She questioned her husband's character, but she also sought to understand, understand him and to confirm that he was not like her father. Together, they chose understanding, peace, love, teamwork, cooperation, happiness, harmony, joy, and togetherness, both within their marriage and with their neighbors. So now that we understand how this why question works and how people can work together to use the why question to explore not a problem, but also what is good about themselves and each other. So the why question works in, in that positive way also. Well, both ways are positive, but, but here's like, why am I a loving person? Why are we a loving co couple? Why do we want to be together? Why do we want to encourage and enrich each other? Why do we want to utilize the, the principles in our lives, like the Unitarian Universalist principles? But these are just starter questions. The answer to these types of questions will lead you to deeper questions, to deeper understanding, to deeper knowledge about oneself and your own partner. Just keep asking why. Why am I this way? And you'll go back to the root cause and feel really good about that. You'll reach this deeper peace within you and with each, within each person with whom you're in a relationship. You will come to understand why you ask why. And the answer is simply because you are love. You are part of the one divine universal energy and you are magnificent. That's the message for today.